All right, before I start the presentation, I was wondering if I could get a show of hands. Team Fortress 2, who here has heard of this game? All right, who here has played this game? Oh, almost everybody, cool, all right. How about this game, Team Fortress Classic, who's heard of it? Who's played it? Just on it. Yeah, see, uh, a lot of people know about Team Fortress 2, but a lot of people don't realize that means there had to have been a Team Fortress 1. But before Team Fortress Classic, there was Quake. Quake came out in 1996. It, was, uh, it came out right after Doom, and it shared a lot of the same design philosophies as Doom did. The two that matter for this presentation are that it had a multiplayer mode, uh, shown in this uh, final picture, and that it was very moddable. And these two things came together when these three individuals, Robin Walker, John Cook, and Ian Caffley, decided to make their own mod for Quake that they called Team Fortress. This was made uh, two months after Quake came out, and its main thing was that there were nine playable classes, each with their own loadouts. Uh, this very quickly became very popular, and it was the most popular Quake mod, and you can still find servers playing it even today. And uh, since it looks like everyone here knows about Team Fortress 2, I thought I'd go over uh, the nine classes that we all know and love. The, when this game first came out, there were actually only five playable classes. There was a scout, a sniper, a soldier, a demo man, and a medic. The heavy weapons guy was added one week later on August 31st, 1996, along with Two Fort, the most popular map in Team Fortress history. Uh, this, this is a screenshot of uh, T Two Fort from Team Fortress Quake, and if you've played Two Fort in Team Fortress 2, uh, it should, you should still be able to recognize where this is in the map. The Pyro was added on Halloween of that year, and the Civilian class was added the next year on January 22nd. Now, if you've only played Team Fortress 2, you might not have heard of him before, but we're going to be going over him later. The last two classes were the Spy and Engineer that were added in June 13th of 1997. Uh, so let's go over Team Fortress Classic a little bit. This game came into existence because at the time, Valve Corporation, uh, they, they had this business strategy where they would go around, they'd find people who made popular mods, and they'd say, hey, we'd like to hire you to remake your mod on one of our engines and sell it as a standalone game. And this happened to Robin, John, and Ian. Now, actually, they were hired to make Team Fortress 2, um, but what they did was they ported Team Fortress Quake over to the Half-Life engine, because uh, that was the engine of the time, Gold Source. Uh, they just ported over whole cloth to show that they could do it, and that's where Team Fortress Classic came from. There are no major gameplay changes from Team Fortress Quake into Team Fortress Classic. The only two real changes was the removal of the sniper's secondary grenade in Team Fortress Quake. He had something called a flare. He could shoot it, and once it hit a wall, it would light up the area around it. That turned out to not be very useful in uh, the Gold Source engine because the maps were just generally better lit. Uh, the only major change other than that were the new, new player models added on June 8th of 2000. This picture you see here is of the old player models, and uh, you will see the new player models in the slides I have dedicated to each playable class. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that that made sense when you see two player models on each of those slides. Uh, so let's go over the gameplay real quick. Uh, this game involved two teams, red versus blue. They would fight to complete objectives. Set objectives were always flag-based, and you're going you're gonna to see that as we go over these four major game modes, that despite their names, all of these game modes had to do with flags. Oh, well, I guess not deathmatch, but the other three did. Uh, the gameplay was very fast-paced. Uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of explosions, a lot of shooting, and people died really quickly, but there was instant respawn to allow you to very quickly get right back into the battlefield and was one of the reasons that this game was considered uh, such, so quick, fast-paced. Uh, also, there were four types of ammo. I'm going to go over them really quickly. Rockets were the ammo used for any sort of explosive weapon, like rocket launchers or grenade launchers. Any sort of bullet-based weapon used shells. Uh, the nail guns, and you'll notice that a lot of different people have nail guns, those all used a special type of ammo called nails. And then the cells, uh, only the engineer used the cells. They were basically metal. Uh, they were what the engineer used to build their buildings. And the reason this matters is because no class in Team Fortress Classic used all four types of ammo. Matter of fact, no class uses three types of ammo. And what that means is that everybody has unneeded ammo that they can throw to teammates by pressing X. They would just wing a little backpack with their extra ammunition. And not only did this promote team play because everybody could share ammo with each other, but also this meant that anybody could help an engineer construct buildings by throwing their unused cells. Um, for additional player stats I want to go over, this is a Half-Life engine. This is the Half-Life engine, so you can see that there's still uh, health and armor, just like Gordon Freeman. There were three types of armor, uh, light, medium, and heavy, and each class only got one. The lighter classes, like the sniper and the scout, had light armor. The heavier classes, like the soldier and the heavy, had heavy armor and everybody else had medium armor and the way armor worked was as you took damage it would subtract a portion of the damage you would have been dealt and apply it to your armor instead 
and uh, the weapons. Oh, the other thing about the ammo with weapons, that they shared ammo pools. Uh, you'll notice as we go over the classes that a lot of these classes had uh, guns that used the same ammo type, and they would only have one pool of ammo to choose from. So if you were one of the classes that had, let's say, the double barrel and the single barrel shotgun, if you fired all your reserve ammo through your double barrel shotgun, you wouldn't have any left to replenish your single barrel shotgun. That only matters for one class, and we're going to go over that when we get to the heavy, but for the time being, the last thing to know is that grenades were rare. Uh, they were difficult to get other than the ones you spawned with. The only place to get more grenades was a special backpack that spawned on the map was marked with a sign saying grenades, and it respawned much slower than other map entities. And the gameplay philosophy behind Team Fortress Quake and Team Fortress Classic was a little interesting. They treated exploits and bugs as a part of game balance. And uh, the most famous one by far is rocket jumping. And the reason I use an example of the Team Fortress 2 soldier in this picture is because uh, rocket jumping in Team Fortress Quake was a bug. When you shot the rocket launcher at your feet, it would explode and then send your character flying, and that was originally a bug, but the developer said, that's awesome, we're going to keep that in there. Uh, actually, we're going to make it so that when we port this game over to Team Fortress Quake, uh, it's actually easier to rocket jump, and it's going to become a core element of the soldier class. Um, and the spy is another example of that. In Team Fortress Quake, it was actually, there was a bug at one point where uh, players would look like the wrong team, and people were complaining about that. They're like, I don't know who to shoot at because uh, the enemy looks like my team. And the devs are like, okay, well, one, we're going to fix that, but now we're going to add a whole new class where that's his entire concept called the spy, and he can disguise his other teammates. Uh, headshots is another thing that I wanted to go over because when the sniper class was added to Team Fortress Quake, his, his gimmick was that when he hit somebody in the head with his sniper rifle, it would deal additional damage. This was a concept never before seen in a shooter, and uh, any shooter you've played in the modern day where headshots are a mechanic, that originated here in Team Fortress Quake. Um, and then finally, the, 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 the core philosophy behind the game and the reason the mod existed was uh, classes with fixed loadouts. So you would have to choose which character you wanted to play as, and they had different loadouts, and those loadouts could not be changed, uh, and no one teammate has the weapons to fill every role on a team. Like, if you think of all the multiplayer games that came out before Team Fortress Quake, like Doom and, uh, well, Quake itself, uh, everybody played as a single person. Uh, you usually picked your weapons off of the ground. You could pick up every single weapon if you were able to get to it, and uh, this this is very different from how the, the, how the class balance worked in Team Fortress Quake. This forced teammates to work together. Uh, so let's go over the four game modes that were in Team Fortress Classic. The most popular by far uh, when it comes to map population was Capture the Flag. I used 2 Fort as an example because it would be a crime not to. 2 Fort is an example of a normal Capture the Flag. So uh, both teams would spawn here and here. Let's use, uh, let's use this team as an example. Your goal is to push through mid into the enemy flag capture zone, grab the flag, and bring the flag back to your side to score a point. That was the majority of Capture the Flag maps in Team Fortress Classic. Some of them were reverse capture the flag. The way that worked was that you had your own flag that spawned on your side of the map, and then your goal was to carry that flag to the enemy side and capture over there. Uh, the next type was football. Football would have a neutral flag. It looked, like a, it looked like a soccer ball, and it would spawn in the middle of the map. Both teams were trying to carry that flag to the enemy side to score. Uh, football was the least popular game mode in Team Fortress Classic. It only had one map and nobody played it. Uh, and then the last one's Variant. I gave Variant its own slide because all of the Variant caps of the flag maps in Team Fortress Classic are rather unusual. And they all kind of have their own identity to them. So I'm going to use this one just to kind of showcase just how weird the Variant game maps can get. Uh, this is Rock 2, my personal favorite map in Team Fortress Classic. Uh, both teams would spawn here and here. Let's play as these guys. What you would do is you would push through mid uh, and you would make it into the enemy administrative buildings. And then once you were there, you would grab a key key card, and then you would move over into the enemy quarantine area and insert that key card, and when you did that, the entire map would fill with gas, and everybody would start dying, and the only survivors would be people that could get to these little quarantine chambers uh, that were here, 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 and here, I believe, and they had Gordon Freeman hazsuits in them that made you immune to gas, giving those players an advantage to grabbing the next key card, because everyone else is too busy being dead. So I think that kind of shows just how weird the variant caps of the flag maps can get, but that's also why they were some of my favorites. The next type of map is control point. Uh, control point maps would have five control points with them. Uh, on this particular map, there's a control point here, 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 and here, uh, and the teams would spawn here and here. 
And the way that a team would capture a control point was they would carry their flag there. Both teams spawned with a flag. And you, your goal would be to move your flag to the next control point in the sequence, uh, whereupon your spawn would advance. And your goal was to capture, both teams' goals were to capture all five control points. And once they pulled that off, they were considered to have won the round. Uh, these maps were very prone to stalemates, so they were not that popular. Much more popular was the other form of control point map, which was attack defense. I'm using Dust Bowl as an example for this type of map because Dust Bowl is the second most popular map in Team Fortress history by far. Um, and then so let, let's take for example as one team blue team is always on attack red team is always on defense And so at the beginning of the map blue team would start here and uh, when they started there Their goal would be to push through this area and get the flag to this control point while red tried to stop them The rest of the map is locked off upon blue succeeding at that the round shuts down then starts up again Now blue is in their new forward spawn This this back part of the map is now locked off this new part of the map is now available and blue is trying to push through uh, this new area to capture this new control point. If they manage to pull that off, the round shuts down, starts up again. This part of the map is now locked off. This part is open and red spawns there. Blue spawns the new forward and they're now trying to push to the final uh, control point whereupon they are considered to have won the round and then the team switch sides. Now, I think the reason that this type of control point map was more popular than the other was due to the fact that it basically was six different game modes in one because depending on, the, first of all, there were three chunks of map and you could only play one at a, any given time and the gameplay was different depending on if you were controlling the blue side or if you were on the blue side or the red side so I think that the the large amount of replayability was why these attack defense control points maps were popular uh, the next type of map was Deathmatch. This was not an official map type, uh, but it could be played. The game had support for it by uh, importing Half-Life multiplayer maps into your maps folder, and they were still. This was still very popular. Uh, the major two things is that first, the, it was still team-based. You were put on a team, and you were trying to score the most points as a team. And the other thing that was notable was that there were four teams. There was a green and a yellow team that you would not normally see in regular Capture the Flag maps. I used Subtransit as my example map because I really liked it because it had this. Uh, uh, this trolley, the trolley from Half-Life, and it would go around the perimeter here, and if you got hit by the trolley, you would die to it, because it's awesome. The, uh, the final map is Hunted. Now, Hunted is a very unusual map. Uh, it's the only appearance of this guy. This is the civilian, the 10th class. He's the only blue player on the map. He would spawn here along with his bodyguards, which was the red team. This is the only map in Team Fortress history where the blue team and the red team are on the same side. Their goal is to escort the civilian through this tunnel, around this driveway, through these offices, over this tarmac, and into this car. Trying to stop them was the yellow team, which was composed entirely of snipers. So you can see it kind of had that, uh, you know, they're trying to assassinate the president and we're trying to get him to safety kind of theme to it. Uh, this game mode was popular at first, but the reason that it kind of died was because if you had an idiot or a troll as the civilian, the map just got unfun for any, everybody. And actually, uh, when Valve was working on Team Fortress 2, they are like, alright, we need to look at what made Hunted popular and what made it unpopular, and uh, through their efforts, this is where Payload came from. So if you've ever played Payload in Team Fortress 2, uh, that is a direct descendant of this map. Uh, so I wanted to go over the nine classes uh, briefly. This is the sniper class. He's the dedicated long-range class in Team Fortress Classic. Oh, and the other thing I want to mention, uh, I did not include pictures of all weapons. I only included pictures of weapons that the players would actually use. You're going to notice that a lot of these characters have a lot, have like a bunch of weapons to choose from, but there's a whole lot of fluff weapons that nobody ever used. So uh, look at the pictures to see what people actually used. Uh, the sniper rifle and automatic rifle were actually the same gun with two separate firing modes. Uh, in sniper rifle mode, you could aim you could aim down sights. Uh, if you hit somebody in the head, it dealt additional damage. And if you hit somebody in the leg, it would actually slow them. Uh, but if you wanted uh, something more, if you wanted more firepower close up, like when you were ambushed, you could switch to automatic rifle mode, where it would fire a bunch of bullets with perfect accuracy. There was no reloads. You would fire as long as you still had sniper bullets left, making it a very powerful but short-lived gun uh, in, in regards to ammo. And then if you ran out of ammo, you could use your nail gun, but nobody ever did. The last weapon was hand grenades. Uh, you're going to notice that everybody gets hand grenades, and except the scout, and they, uh, you know, they're just they're standard. You can defend yourself with them. Uh, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention. About 
about the sniper, he has the lowest health and the weakest armor, so he was the squishiest class in Team Fortress uh, Classic. On the complete opposite side of the spectrum is the soldier. He was the all-rounder class. He had the best armor. He had a bunch of health. His rocket launcher let him deal, uh, you know, splash damage, and it let him rocket jump around the map. And then if he didn't feel like using it, he had the very powerful double-barrel shotgun. Uh, he didn't use the single-barrel shotgun. He had the versatile hand grenades, and then he had the nail grenades. The way those worked was uh, a nail grenade would explode. You would throw it, and it would shoot nails in all directions for like five seconds before exploding, making it a good area denial tool. Um, and then one thing about the, the crowbar, you'll see that most classes have a crowbar for a melee. Uh, nobody used them. They, uh, the crowbar was terrible. Uh, the only classes that used their melee weapons, it was because they were given a special melee weapon that had a special ability. Uh, the demo man is a defensive class. He can deal a lot of damage, but he had to worry about self-damage because he had medium health and medium armor. Um, he, had, he had a grenade launcher that could shoot two different types of grenades. Pipes would bounce off of walls and explode after a short period of time, or they would explode immediately upon hitting an enemy. Sticky launchers wouldn't explode at all. They would just stick to walls or floors or wherever he was aiming at, and they wouldn't explode until the demo man pressed right click. Uh, you'll see that the demo man in Chief Forge Classic actually has a single barrel shotgun, but he never used it. The thing about the single barrel shotgun in this game was that it was very weak and it didn't deal enough damage for any of the classes who have it to bother using it. So even though the demo man in this game had a hit scan weapon, it went completely unused. Uh, rounding out his explosive arsenal were uh, hand grenades, and then the way Merv grenades, they would explode into tiny bomblets, which then exploded. So lots of explosions from the Merv grenades. The dead pack you would prime uh, for five seconds by setting it on the ground whereupon there would be this shrill beeping, and then it would explode, detonating everybody within a short radius. Nobody ever died to this thing because it was way too easy to hear it. The way you actually used it for was for finding these, uh, these little yellow triangles on the map. Uh, maps would have blocked off passageways with these uh, triangles in front of them, and if a demo man were to blow up his debt pack, uh, it would clear that passageway for his teammate to use. And it was kind of cool because it created this, uh, this mini objective where you know, the attacking team would try to reach these corridors and open them up for their team. And if the defensive team could get their demo man in there, a debt pack would also somehow seal a passage that had already been blown up. So that was kind of cool. Uh, the medic. First, I'm going to go over how Valve intended the medic to be used. Valve intended the medic to be a support class who could defend himself with the reliable double barrel shotgun and hand grenades. The concussion grenades would send anybody near them flying, so they were supposed to use them to knock enemies away from them. Um, and then they also had a super nail gun, which was better than regular nail guns. And finally, the weapon they were supposed to care about most was the med kit. Uh, the med kit would heal teammates if you whacked them with it, or it would overheal them. And if you hit an enemy with the med kit, it would infect them. And infection causes your health to uh, you know, disappear slowly over time. It would also spread via contact to any other people on the enemy team who come in contact with that person. So everybody's favorite noob in Team Fortress Classic was the one who got infected and proceeded to run into spawn, uh, because that person would be infecting everybody as they spawn, and also he could keep eating the med kits that spawned so that he would never die and he would just permanently infect his team so everybody loved that guy uh, but anyway that didn't really happen that much because it turns out that the medic doesn't use his med kit at all the actual way that people end up playing the medic was the best offensive class in the game uh, his primary weapon was the concussion grenade which he did not use to knock enemies away from him he used them to concussion jump through the map uh, use his super nail gun and his hand grenades to blow up sentries use his double barrel to blow up enemies and escape with the flag he was the primary flag runner in the team fortress classic meta um, and the other flag runner in the game was the scout uh, you can see that the scout has the single barrel shotgun, which I've mentioned is terrible, but he used it anyway because he had nothing better. Uh, the nail gun was, was decent. He had the concussion grenades. Caltrops were like these little jacks that you'd throw on the ground, and if somebody stepped on them, they'd be slowed. They weren't really used that much. Uh, and the scout had uh, really bad armor and really bad health. So you can see that there's almost no reason to use the scout over the medic, except that the scout moved slightly faster. And for that reason, and just that reason, the scout played a vital role in every level of Team Fortress Classic, and and you'll see him at all levels of play. And I think that that, more than anything else, emphasizes just how important mobility was in this game. There is no reason to use this guy over this guy other than his speed, and that just caused him to be meta. 
Uh, the heavy weapons guy is the complete opposite side of the spectrum. He is the slowest class in the, in the game with the best armor. He is a dedicated defensive class due to his speed. He has an assault cannon that fires a bunch of bullets really quickly. He has a double barrel and a single barrel shotgun for defense, uh, but what's notable is that, uh, remember I mentioned about how ammo shares pools? These three guns use the same pool. So if you run out of ammo with your assault cannon, you aren't able to reload your double barrel or your single barrel shotgun, meaning that you basically just didn't use them because your assault cannon was, was more powerful all the time. Uh, and then he had the ubiquitous hand grenades and then the same Merv grenades as the demo man. Uh, so he had, he had a lot of explosive, a lot of power at his disposal, but he was definitely the easiest class in the game to play. The engineer is the other defensive class. Uh, he's got a double barrel shotgun to defend himself. The rail gun was a shitty pistol nobody used. The hand grenades uh, were standard. The EMP grenades are interesting. So the way the EMP grenades worked is that if you if, if they blow up, anybody within uh, range of the EMP grenade would have all of their ammo blow up on their person. And so what this translated to was that very heavy classes like soldier and heavy would probably die, but light classes like scout wouldn't take that much damage. So it was a very interesting re reversed powered grenade. Uh, the primary primary weapon for the engineer, his job is to use his wrench to construct buildings. Uh, the sentry plays much like the sentry in Team Fortress 2. It could be upgraded three times. You placed it in a location, it would uh, rotate, it could see within 360 degrees around itself, and it would fire a bunch of bullets at any enemies who wandered within its sight. Uh, the dispenser would uh, could be placed and would give ammo to teammates. It would not heal them. It could replenish their armor, but uh, unlike the dispenser in Team Fortress 2, you would not be able to heal your teammates using it. Uh, it also had to be resupplied by the engineer. The engineer had to use his metal to stock the engineer. Or, I'm sorry, to, st to stock the dispenser with ammunition to give to teammates. Also, fun fact about the dispenser in this game: enemies could use it. If an enemy walked past an enemy dispenser, it would he would receive ammo. But the engineer in question would receive a notice that enemies were using his. Uh, dispenser and then he could then detonate it and treat it as an explosive uh, so you would get strats where people would stick dispensers around corners or near the flag and then blow people up with them the teleporter, uh, oh, and also the dispenser cannot be upgraded. It doesn't have a level 1, 2, 3. Neither does the teleporter. Uh, the teleporter plays exactly like the teleporter from Team Fortress 2. The engineer has to place an entrance. He has to place an exit, whereupon any of his teammates or himself can use it to teleport from the entrance to the exit on cooldown. Uh, the Pyro was a useless class. There was no reason to play him. Um, and the reason for that was that flames in this game dealt ridiculously low damage. Such low damage that it just did not matter if you were set on fire. For that reason, there was no reason to use the flamethrower. The incendiary cannon was a really bad rocket launcher that set people on fire. Uh, the single barrel shotgun, remember I've mentioned that that gun is like, really bad, so nobody ever used it for anything. He has hand grenades, which are good. Too bad everybody else gets them. And the napalm grenades are shitty grenades that would light people on fire. So again, all, all of his weapons and set people on fire, but there was no reason to set people on fire, so there was no reason to play the pyro. Uh, and then the last reason that the pyro sucked is that, remember I mentioned that every weapon in the game uses either rockets, bullets, or nails? Well, the flamethrower is actually the one game, the one weapon in the game that used cells, the same, uh, the same ammo as the engineer metal, and I think the reason for that was that it was the only weapon that clearly didn't shoot bullets, rockets, or nails, but that led to the fact that the pyro is the only class who could not throw cells to an engineer near to help him build buildings. Uh, so, yeah, that they're just... Oh, and also I wanted to mention that the uh, Team Fortress 2 comics revealed that the Team Fortress Classic Pyro is actually a woman. Uh, so we were not aware of this back when we played Team Fortress Classic, and she sounds uh, just as male as the other characters, but this does make her the only playable female in any Team Fortress game. Uh, the final class of the spy, he's the last of the offensive classes. Uh, he had a trank pistol. He could, sh he could shoot people to slow them down. It was never used. The double barrel shotgun was his primary form of defense. Nail gun uh, was not used that much. Hand grenades were used. I'm going to go over that. The hallucination grenade was kind of cool. What it would do is if somebody was hit with the hallucination grenade, they would see phantom explosions. They would take phantom damage, and they would see phantom enemies. So it was a cool weapon. Um, and it saw a bit of use just because there's no reason not to throw it. Uh, but And then the knife was a backstab weapon. Uh, if you hit somebody with it in the back, it would instantly kill them. And his primary form of, his primary class feature was the disguise. He could disguise himself to look like enemies, and he could also feign death, which caused him to lie on the ground and pretend to be a corpse. He did not have invisibility. That's something that, that they added in Team Fortress 2. Um, but anyway, regarding this guy's role, he wasn't actually used against players that often. And the reason for that was, if you were a halfway decent player, you could recognize a spy uh, because there were just some telltale giveaways. There was only 
only one weapon he'd hold per class, and it wasn't usually the weapon you'd expect somebody to be holding in that situation. He moved at regular spy speed, and it was just really obvious. So his primary goal was against sentries who were fooled by disguises, and you could throw grenades without dropping your disguise. So the main thing you'd, you'd see with spies was they'd find out where a sentry is, usually by playing somebody else, switch to spy, go there, lob a bunch of grenades onto the sentry while disguised, and then switch to something else after the sentry was blown up to take advantage of the sentry being gone. Uh, so I want to go a little bit over the community of Team Fortress Classic, the way that people played this game. I'm going to go over the bottom bullet first uh, because a lot of these others are related to it. Uh, so back then there were low internet speeds, just naturally, because that was how far technology had progressed. And it led to very regional communities where you couldn't really play people halfway across the world. You had to be playing with people who lived near you, and that was a large part of the reason that clans were built up. Oh, I also wanted to mention that this game came bundled with Half-Life for free for uh, most, of its, most of its life. And that was where the majority of the player base came from because Half-Life was the best selling game of its time and all of those people could play Team Fortress Classic. Uh, so uh, but, uh, this, uh, Team Fortress Classic actually did not come out with voice chat. It was added later. And before voice chat came out, you would use uh, IRC channels and VOIP phone channels uh, to communicate and that was another reason why you'd want to join a clan so that you could all join the same voice chat and communicate while you're in game. Uh, the next thing I want to mention is the Catacombs. The Catacombs was the biggest Team Fortress Classic forum on the internet and definitely by far the largest community. And uh, they got shut down in 2015 because of a very unfortunate circumstance that I won't go into, but they aren't around anymore. But they, they hosted these weekly development of frag videos. Uh, so there's actually like a whole frag video community before YouTube. Uh, and so they would be hosted on community funded sites, uh, some of which are still in existence if you want to go check them out. Uh, but the but yeah, so the communities were very regional, and the only time that you would get to see people playing from different parts of the world was during during very special tournament events. Uh, yeah, so there were tournaments. Team Fortress Classic was one of the earliest esports. The way that the, the 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 meta, the competitive meta that evolved, was basically both teams would 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 choose to divide themselves into two specific groups. Uh, their team would have offense, which would be scouts and medics. The scouts and medics would attempt to bunny hop through the enemy lines grab the flag and push the flag closer and closer to mid and then eventually carry the flag in to capture on their side of the map. The defense was composed of heavy weapon guys, soldiers and engineers. The other classes were not really used. Uh, and so the way people watched Team Fortress Classic was through something called Half-Life TV. Um, the way Half-Life TV, it's kind of unusual, but basically you would boot your game up and then the server where the tournament is being played would send its information to your game and so you would watch it like that. And then the way you would listen to the shoutcast is by connecting to a specific shoutcast VOIP server. And uh, this, was, this was such a long time ago that I've scoured the internet and, and I've, I've searched m multiple times, not just for this presentation. And as far as I can find, there's only one surviving shoutcast from one of these tournaments. This was from France versus Sweden, 2005. We're only going to watch one minute of it. Uh, but while you watch this footage, keep an eye out for two things. Keep an eye out for the flag. Uh, see what's going on right there. Um, and keep an eye on the chat. You'll see that in the chat, uh, the team is, well, I'll just watch the video and we'll talk about it afterwards. We not have time to talk strategy here during this little flag-touching exchange. Check it back in on the Swedish side. Oh boy, this flag got moved quite a ways. Morgan with a great run, and he gets this flag all the way out to the edge of the cave now. Team Sweden might just lose this one first. And there goes France. Another scout is in for Team France. That was KZ. Get a quick touch and a grab, and he throws it down to the floor of the main room now. Team France up to a very fast start and they're making a much stronger showing so far than they made in the last game wow there we go both flags outside now team sweden pulls one as well as france and both teams are going to put it home shortly shortly to be 10 to 10 both teams capping on each other first so did you see so so first of all did you keep an eye on the flag did you notice how the flag was uh was moving as uh, yeah, that the flag was moving, and then did you notice that in the chat, um, that the in the chat people were saying things like, uh, you know, scout dropped flag here, um, and those that that was not part of the game. Those were specific scripts written by the scout and medic players on both teams. Uh, it would give coordinates of where the flag was right now, and these guys would use those chat messages to know where the flag was on the field because they actually knew where the where those coordinates actually referred to. 
uh, because the game was just that fast paced. You also notice that after capturing, the scout suicided. And the reason he did that is because scouts and medics care deeply about rollouts, which was uh, the path that they took from spawn to the enemy flag room. And they had practiced the, the rollout from spawn so often that they didn't develop a rollout from flag capture because there was no reason to use it because the flag because flags were captured so rarely. They just wanted to use the one rollout that they knew. Uh, so yeah, this was a very, very fast-paced game. Uh, and you should, I mean, if you really want to, you can go watch the whole thing. Uh, I've provided a link to this description in the uh, Slack channel. Uh, but anyway, I also wanted to pay some lip service to Fortress Forever. Fortress Forever was made um, uh, in around 2000. It was start, They started development on around 2006. It was a fan-made Team Fortress Classic mod. Uh, the, the point of it was to port the gameplay to Source 2 because Half-Life 2 had come out. It was the modern engine, and they thought that you know people want to play the Team Fortress Classic on the most modern engine. Uh, so they, they attempted to modernize the game a little bit. Uh, they, they only had two like, super big changes that they made. Uh, was the scout had a new deployable. It was called a jump pad. The way it worked was the scout could lay it on the ground, and then anyone on his team who uh, jumped on the jump pad would be sent flying in a direction kind of as if they conk jumped. Uh, and then the pyro was given a jetpack to try to give him a bit more mobility. Um, he still kind of sucked, though. Uh, anyway, the Fortress Forever came out in 2007, which turned out to be pretty bad timing because shortly afterwards, Team Fortress 2, the official Valve sequel, came out uh, after nine years of development. That being said, Fortress Forever has always had a community. Uh, uh, in 2015, it got enough votes in Steam Greenlight to be added to Steam as a standalone title, and you can go play it right now for free. And if you wanted to try the Team Fortress Classic gameplay but didn't want to pay the $5 to actually buy the actual game, Fortress Forever is your best opportunity to go try Team Fortress Classic and see what makes this game so great. Uh, and I also want to spend a bit of time talking about the influence Team Fortress Classic had on its sequel, Team Fortress 2. Uh, so Valve famously worked on Team Fortress 2 for nine years. It was like the vaporware of its time, where everybody kind of joked about how it was never going to come out because Valve was super secretive. Um, and it was actually almost completely like remade from scratch multiple times. The first iteration of Team Fortress 2 was Valve's Team Fortress. Uh, the first major change, first of all, you can notice that it's got more of a military theme to it. Um, there was a new class called the Commander. He played kind of like a real-time strategy. He didn't have an entity on the map. He, uh, he could see through these cameras that his teammates would set up, and he kind of was supposed to keep a more global... Uh, philosophy of what was going on. He could he could dr have like air airstrikes and he could drop supplies to the dudes on the field. Uh, you'll also notice that there were vehicles in this version of Team Fortress Classic and that the snipers had an ability to turn invisible, which was the first time that we saw invisibility added as a, as a concept to Team Fortress. Uh, but this was eventually scrapped uh, in large part due to the commander class who turned out to be too uh, too confusing, not too confusing, but they had trouble reconciling, they had trouble making it so that both the commanders and the and the players uh, were having fun. So their next attempt to make Team Fortress 2 was called Brotherhood of Arms. Uh, it had a couple extra playable classes, but uh, the first thing I want to mention is that in this one, they decided that their goal was ultra-realism. They wanted to make the most realistic shooter on the market to date. Uh, and so for that reason, uh, they had things such as a limited number of lives. If you died too many times, you wouldn't be allowed to re-enter the map. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm not surprised that that didn't stick around. Uh, they had 12 playable classes. The commander was still in there. They were still trying to make that work. I don't think they really did. The officer was a morale-based class. He could shoot. He could shout at people on his team, and people that were moralized would like play better, and their morale would decay over time. The instructor was kind of cool. The instructor and the instructor was an NPC class. So the way the instructor worked was he would be right there in the battlefield with everybody else, but he'd stay on the. He'd stay on the friendly side, and his job was to advise new players of what to do. So he was like a built-in tutorial, like, who was just there for the new players during regular multiplayer matches, which is kind of a cool concept, honestly. Uh, but this, uh, this, this eventually got scrapped because they, uh, they, they kind of realized that they were going the wrong direction, that, ultra, that realism wasn't the way to go uh, with a game like Team Fortress, where the levels are locked off into little arenas, um, and just in general, they decided that this was when it wasn't really working, so they decided to completely revamp the game into more of an aliens versus humans themes. They gave us like a sci-fi uh, skin to it. Uh, that there's this whole concept around resource collection. Uh, so basically, if you did things like you know kill people or you could collect collect stuff on the map, you would do, you would collect resources, which would go into a team pool, and then the team could use those resources to build constructions and defenses. The heavy weapons guy and the demo were replaced in this version by two new classes. 
The sapper was a class built entirely around, remember that EMP grenade I described? Well, like the, that mechanic, there was a whole class built around that mechanic. And we don't know what the support was supposed to do because the uh, Team Fortress invasion was actually scrapped before Team Fortress, before they made the support class. Uh, and this entire, this entire concept was scrapped for being too complex. They realized that they had kind of, they'd, they'd strayed too far from what made Team Fortress Classic popular. And they said, let's go back to our roots and try to keep things a little more grounded. And that's where the Team Fortress 2 that we all know came from. And you'll notice that they, they really tried to simplify things a little. Remember I talked about how there are all these useless weapons that nobody used uh, on each class? Well, they, they got rid of all those, and they made sure that everybody only has a few weapons that were actually useful. Uh, they went for a more cartoony, unrealistic style instead of trying to pretend that this was a realistic game. And then I think the most important decision they made was to make each class a real three-dimensional character. These guys had personalities, a bunch of lines, backstories, names uh, that, that people could really identify with. And they could identify with them even more because of the addition of lore building videos and comics that fleshed out the universe in a way that you wouldn't see in game. Uh, I think Overwatch is probably the game that has done the most to uh, uh, mimic this idea of having an entire world that is explained through extracurricular materials. And really, games like Team Fortress 2 and Team Fortress Classic are, or, or, or in Overwatch, are the legacy of Team Fortress Classic. Pretty much any class-based shooter that exists, and they are all over the place, and that is the major legacy of Team Fortress Classic. Uh, the other one is headshots, the other ubiquitous concept that you see in almost every game these days. You have Team Fortress Classic to thank for that. Uh, I don't have a thank you slide, but thank you very much for listening.